All right, so in this section we will cover uh, SD-WAN and routing. So in the first section we talked about how we can secure the access, how I make sure that you know I understand who is trying to connect to my network and then I add or apply different group policies to them based on their role or based on their endpoint that you're using, whether it's corporate or not, and how we use System Manager to help with classifying this. Um, after getting access to the network, the first thing users would do is trying to access some applications or services. And those applications can be hosted locally or can be hosted on the cloud or even, you know, these services could be just, uh, you know, browsing internet using YouTube, Facebook, whatever it might be. And normally, um, to connect to the network, you, you will need to have WAN um, connections, whether it's internet or MPLS, it doesn't really matter. And normally, most of customers, they go with the redundancy, so they have a secondary link in case the primary fails. And traditionally, people actually found to load balance using traditional um, features or traditional uh, routing protocols was quite difficult. So they ended up with having one link to work as primary, the other link to, to be a secondary and waiting for the primary to fail. And of course, that's not ideal because you pay for the service, you want to get the best use out of it. Uh, so definitely want to do some sort of load balancing to get you know, do the, the two links to operate or work at the same time. And that's what SD-WAN solved. So potentially with SD-WAN, as I, we mentioned at the beginning, you can do uh, load balancing, you can do policy-based routing and performance-based routing. So in this section, we're going to cover how we actually can use SD-WAN and how we can do performance-based routing. And also we're going to talk about dynamic routing in general. Um, and what we will cover there is like how we can integrate with uh, a third-party network, let's say, that using something like BGP to advertise and learn, learn routes. So we'll see how we can integrate that to our uh, network that we created. And also, we just cover how routing operates in general. So, what, you know, how the MX make the dis routing decisions and how we can do transition or um, integrate with third-party networks that not using Meraki. So as you can see now, we do have the site uh, that we created. Uh, what we will do, we'll have a secondary link connected to it. So I have a new network called Webinar, which is exactly the same setup, um, and have dual links, WAN2 and WAN1. WAN2 is actually going to be a bad link. So we have a lot of drops on that link and a lot of uh, jitter. And you can see it's going to be connected to my server, uh, which sits in the data center. And I do have a stream running from that server, like a continuous stream. So that can be represent, uh, that can actually, um, yeah, that can be like a, a phone call or can be someone's trying to watch uh, YouTube or downloading email. So we'll see the experience there and see when we configure policy-based routing uh, or performance-based routing as well, how that can impact the performance of my WAN. So let's go and configure this real quick. Um, I do have, as I mentioned, the same setup, but on a different network called Webinar. Um, so this MX uh, or SD-WAN appliance actually have dual links, WAN1 and WAN2. And potentially, if I go here to my uh, SD-WAN traffic shaping, shaping policy, uh, you will see that I don't have anything special there, just no policies. So my preferred WAN is WAN1, which is a good link I have. So what I want to do now is I'm going to actually create a preference for the server that um, I'm actually broadcasting my uh, stream from. And I will force this traffic to use my WAN2. So let's say for traffic coming from any source going to a specific destination, which is my uh, server IP address. Oh, actually, I'll put the port later. So my port that I'm using is 600 for the stream and 700, that, that's basically my HTML uh, website. All right, so what I will do here, I'll actually select my WAN2 to be my preferred link. And actually, I'm going to fail the traffic over uh, if my WAN2 fails. Means 
uh, if my when to physically down, that's when the traffic to be moved. So this is a simple policy-based routing policy. We didn't do anything special there. It just, the traffic will go through when to as my preferred link, and then whenever my when to fails, it will move this traffic to when one. Policy-based routing, nothing really special. Let's go actually and test the stream that we do have on my um, port 600, which I'm using port 700 to interface me. So that's the HTML code that I use. And 600 is basically the actual stream, the port that the actual stream is using. So I'm just going to play this. And what you will hear here um, will be some drops. So um, that's potentially because 12 is really bad. And just imagine you have a phone call over this link. That's potentially the performance that you will get. So let's just hear this for a minute just to get an experience of the quality of the audio. So you see some drops now, started audio, more drops, like that's the performance of the link. It's actually not smooth, it's not going the way we wanted. It's still, you know, all this gap now is pure drops. More drops, right? So you got the idea now with policy-based routing, it's actually pushing the traffic to my WAN2, but it's not going to make a decision to move this traffic um, till WAN2 actually fails. So let's see what we can do with actually using SD-WAN. So I, I will actually create a class here for my performance and I will say if my latency go beyond 10 milliseconds and jitter maybe 12, packet drops will be 3%, I want the traffic to be moved. So here what I've done now, I've just created a class. You can create as many classes as you like. I will attach this class to my policy. So instead of saying fail over if uplink is down, I'm just gonna say fail over if the performance is bad. And then I will just specify the class I've just created, which is stream, and I hit save. So what we're doing here now is we're telling our MX or our SD-WAN appliance, whenever we had performance issue on the WAN2 that we do have as primary for my streaming traffic, uh, please move this traffic across to WAN1, assuming WAN1, of course, is performing uh, better. So let me actually go now and apply the same or re recheck the stream. Um, in fact, I'm going to also open another page, with this, uh, sorry, which is the one giving me or showing me the decisions of SD-WAN. So here it will tell me if we move this traffic for any reason. So you see here that um, the rule saying move the traffic when uh, the uplink is down. So let's play the same stream and see now what will be the performance um, when we apply this rule. So as you can see, the performance was 100% from the beginning. And if you have noticed, uh, what I clicked on was actually a decision that the MX made, which moved the traffic to WAN 1 because the performance was bad. So automatically, the MX actually, after analyzing the, the two links we have, you see here, uh, the threshold that we put was 10 for the latency and on um, that side of the report, you see that the, the latency was actually around 24, 25 milliseconds. So straight away, the MX noticed that the link is not performing as our expectations and not matching the thresholds that we defined. So straight away, move the traffic to uh, the WAN1. And from your perspective as an end user, you didn't actually even notice any drops. It was smooth. Uh, the, the decision being made straight away by the MX and you're good to go. That ha that's how SD-WAN works and that's how easy you can configure SD-WAN to make sure 
your critical traffic always use the best link you have. So you see, again, you know, this is basically the decision that Amex made uh, to move the traffic from WAN2 to WAN1 because of the performance. The next thing that we want to talk about will be um, covering the um, routing piece. So I'm actually going to go to the network diagram that we did see before, which is um, that network diagram. And let me bring back my uh, dashboard. So what we want to do now is, as you can see, here we do have a router that connecting to a domain, a BGP domain, which could be network that not using Meraki, so we cannot do side-to-side -side VPN across it. Uh, it could be third party as well that uh, you know we don't have control over, but we still need to communicate with them. Or if you do like a slow migration and not getting all your sites to Meraki, you might end up with this setup where you have some sites on Meraki and we can do side-to-side -side VPN advertise the LAN subnet through the tunnel. So you've seen in the first section, we didn't actually really need to configure any dynamic routing to advertise the LAN subnets. We just basically went to side-to-side -side VPN and specified which subnets to be advertised, and that was pretty much it. But um, if you do have another network using maybe um, a Cisco traditional router like ISRs or any other vendor, um, and still doing like slow migration, we will end up with having some sites on Meraki and some sites not. So in this case, what we will do is, we will establish tunnels from our lab station to the concentrator. So we're gonna have another MX work in a concentrator mode or one arm mode. And then this concentrator basically will terminate the tunnels from our branches, have the routes learn from our branches through the tunnels, and then peer with my gateway, which is a Cisco router, with BGP and we will advertise those subnets to BGP and also learn the BGP subnets through uh, the gateway and then let the VPN concentrator advertise them back to our branches. So we'll do this process and we will configure it to give you an idea how it can be configured and how actually it looks and works. So I do have a new MX, another MX which is MX400 so this MX is currently configured uh, with the standard configuration. So actually nothing really in there. It's just going to be in a normal routed mode. So let's go to the MX and configure uh, that one to be in a VPN concentrator. Sorry, so I'll go here to addressing and VLAN. And instead of having it in routed mode, I will just actually configure it in a VPN concentrator or pass through mode. That means it will be connected to the network via a single link. <clears throat> and I will also configure this one to be a hub. So making sure that, um, you know, that one will be the one the remote branches will terminate tunnels to. The next step here would be, I need to establish BGP peering with my gateway. So BGP here is still in beta. So if I actually go and enable this one, I can configure my AS number. So the AS number that we use here is 66530. Uh, so I'm going to use 31 as my um, AS number. And then I'll just configure the IP address of my router and the AS number of my router here. And I hit save. So I hope that I entered, all right, sorry, 65. Okay, so what I've done now, I'm just, I configured my dashboard to peer with my router. Um, I need to go to the router and configure the peering there. So this is my router, oh, sorry, of course. I'm using the most secure password and username. Let's check if there is any BGP configured for this specific um, router. No. 
Cool. Let me go and check the IP address that I have on the VPN concentrator. Um, so the IP here is dot forty nine. So I'm just going to configure a new neighbor for this router. And as you can see, I do have a couple of routes that I'm actually advertising through my BGP. Uh, let's see if we actually have neighborship established. So you can see now I do have neighborship established with my um, MX. Uh, I'm not actually expecting any routes to be learned. And reason being, because we actually have the tunnels established with my gateway MX at the moment. So what we need to do, we go to our template, configure the tunnels to go to the VPN concentrator. So let's do that really quick from the configuration template. So I'm not actually going to do it from individual sites. I go here to my configuration template. I will go to site to side VPN. And then from there, I should be able to see that I do have another device that I can establish tunnels with, which in this case will be my VPN. So now, in a second, I'll be able to have all those subnets that we just or all those VLANs that we created on our branch to be advertised to my VPN concentrator and then the VPN concentrator will advertise them through to my BGP and we will learn those routes and advertise them through. In fact, if I go to my VPN concentrator now, I should see some routes coming from BGP. So let's go and check the routing table to see what's going on there. All right, so you see here there's two subnets um, they call it external, which is this 10.200 and 10.233. And now we're learning, you know, the subnets from our side-to-side -side VPN. So if I go to my router now and I check the routing table, you will see now I should have, or I can actually see uh, the LAN subnets that we actually configured on our uh, branch getting advertised through. So that's how you can either do, um, I would say, a slow migration if you use Meraki devices on part of your network and non-Meraki devices. You can actually use some dynamic routing, whether it's OSPF or static routes or even BGP, and leak the routes between your BGP domain or third-party network and a Meraki network. So this is just a quick overview of how SD-WAN works and how routing works in general. Um, in the next section, we're going to talk about the, how we can use Meraki devices as sensors, and we'll see some uh, of the APIs calls.